The following video contains observations of a lowly professional hobby machinist with a limited set of experiences. This content is not intended to be a CNC review, nor should it be construed as endorsement or purchasing advice. Viewer discretion is optional. Hello guys, Winston here. In my last video, I showed you how I designed and prototyped a dozen isogrid pattern drink coasters using Fusion 360 and the Nomad 3 CNC. And with that project, I touched on some of the tricks I used to be as efficient as possible with those tools. The Nomad 3 is a compact desktop CNC that I sometimes use for prototyping and even light duty production. It's a nimble, precise machine, but with relatively low power. For reference, the typical compact router on a Shape Oko is four times stronger than the Nomad spindle. So while I do like the Nomad, when I was making these coasters I felt like I was reaching the limits of the platform. And this is the point where, as a hobby machinist, you might start dreaming of buying a bigger, more expensive CNC machine. Maybe you find yourself messing with the Haas product configurator at night before remembering that you have no room in the garage for a machining center, not enough money in your bank account for one either, and you eventually cry yourself to sleep. We, we've all been there, right? But what if for just a moment we hypothetically indulge this notion, to an extravagant extent no less? You've seen the title for this video, you know where this is going. What would it be like to prototype or even manufacture in moderate quantities parts on a professional grade CNC machine? Would it be a quantum leap forward from life on a desktop CNC? Would the difficulties of CNC machining suddenly evaporate? Or are there more similarities in the experience than you might think? I'm fortunate enough to work at a place that has what I consider to be the perfect CNC for this case study, and I have bosses with enough courage to let me use it occasionally on the weekends. I am of course talking about the Datron Neo, a machine you may have seen glimpses of on my Instagram feed. If you're a machinist by trade, you might not get as much out of this video. But if you're like me and are self-taught, maybe you started with a desktop machine in your garage or heck, maybe your living room, I think you might find this an interesting look into a very different world of machining. Before we get to that though, let's recap my previous isogrid coaster experience on the Nomad 3 as a baseline. The drink coasters I designed and prototype were aluminum, which meant I needed to employ conservative feeds and speeds to keep the Nomad 3's spindle happy. Light, quick, and consistent cuts using an adaptive toolpath strategy made sure everything ran reliably, but the amount of time it took to machine each coaster added up quickly. Since the Nomad 3 lacked an automatic tool changer, I was trying to machine as many coasters at a time as possible. That way I wouldn't need to check in on the machine as frequently and be constantly loosening and tightening and loosening and tightening and loosening and tightening the collet for tool changes. I used a single end mill, an eighth inch single flute for both roughing and finishing, plus a chamfer tool that only needed to be swapped in and run for a few minutes at the end of each batch. The size of my work area, 8 by 8 inches, meant that I could just barely fit four coasters on the table at a time. Each run took about four hours. So if I theoretically wanted to make a business of selling drink coasters, I could run a set of four in the morning when I got into work, and then a set after lunch. That's eight coasters per day, 40 coasters a week if I keep regular hours, and that's actually not too bad. It'd probably be enough throughput to saturate the market for isogrid drink coasters if I wanted to keep at it for a couple weeks. But what if your need for machining speed was greater? Let's say sales really started taking off, or I came up with a different product idea that required more machining time per part. Wouldn't it feel so liberating to make a financially irresponsible CNC purchase and step up into the big leagues of machining? Well, I think it's time to familiarize ourselves with the Datron Neo. If you're already acquainted with the Neo, feel free to skip ahead, I'll try to remember to put chapter markers in this video. But if you're not familiar with this unique piece of subtractive machining technology, let me give you the 60 second elevator pitch. Imagine a CNC with a work area of about 20 by 16 inches, 500 by 400 millimeters for the imperially impaired. That's a working area wider than a standard Shape Oko 4 in a chassis that's actually narrower. The Neo is roughly the volume of an arcade machine and it can be wheeled through a passageway just 32 inches wide. It'll fit through a standard width doorway so you can set it up basically anywhere. 
Add a 40,000 RPM ATC spindle and pair it with a 24 pocket tool magazine. Bolt on direct drive servo motors for rapid feed rates in excess of 1,000 inches per minute. Include a mist cooling system that shoots jets of aerosolized alcohol at the cutter that leaves no oily residue after machining. This might be one of the few professional grade CNC machines where your parts come out cleaner than they went in. Effectively sanitized. Those are just some of the highlights in rapid succession. The NEO is a very interesting machine in a pretty unique form factor. There are many applications where the NEO shines and many where it isn't a good fit. It's great for prototyping very detailed or precise things. Its accuracy is measured not in thousandths of an inch, but in microns. But it's not so good for hogging through pounds and pounds of material, especially steel. The spindle is only rated at 2 kilowatts. That's not even 3 horsepower. A Haas VF2 for comparison can have 30 horsepower at the spindle motor. I guess spiritually, the Neo is kind of like a more advanced, more expensive, bigger brother from a German mother to the Nomad 3, if you kind of squint a bit. Before we talk about using this machine, however, we need to talk about work holding. This particular Neo is equipped with vacuum work holding and only vacuum work holding. No vices, no clamps, just a vacuum fixture. So we need to talk about how this works. Datron's vacuum system for the Neo isn't your average vacuum work holding setup for a CNC milling machine. Usually, you find a small vacuum generator paired with a gasketed fixture. The gasket seals against the material, air is sucked out from below the cavity of the fixture, and the ambient atmospheric pressure smushes the stock down. This kind of setup is very strong, as you can often pull a near-perfect vacuum within the fixture, but it doesn't tolerate leaks very well. If there's a break in the seal, your gasket is old and has a crack, your part will probably go flying off as soon as an end mill makes contact with it. The vacuum system used by Datron is much closer in philosophy to the kind of vacuum work holding you'd see on a CNC router that pulls air through MDF. You use a vacuum pump that would be overkill in most circumstances, and a semi-permeable membrane that limits how much air can rush into the cavity of the fixture even if nothing was covering it up. Air trickles through the entire surface of that membrane, creating negative pressure between it and whatever covers it. The Neo doesn't use MDF as that membrane though, it uses vacuum card. Basically, paper cardstock that's not sealed or laminated. It's kind of like the inside of a cereal box. The vacuum fixture itself is subdivided into zones that you can turn on and off via these little rubber plugs. Most of the time, this system works beautifully, but it does have its limitations. In an ideal world, we would be able to achieve a perfect vacuum with this system, that's 14.7 pounds per square inch. That pressure, acting on a 10 by 10 inch plate of material, would exert 1470 pounds of force on the table, which sounds great. But it's impossible to achieve a perfect vacuum. On a good day, with smooth and flat material, you can expect to see pressure losses of 5 to 10 percent. Now, factor in that many materials are not naturally flat or even perfectly smooth. The vacuum card you're using might have been cut into slightly from a previous job, then you might see 80% vacuum. Still decent, but in some cases, if your material is noticeably warped and too rigid to yield to the downward crush of ambient air pressure, you'll get even more leakage, sometimes bad enough that the vacuum fixture simply won't work. Extruded or rolled aluminum sheets and bars often have a slight curve in them, or a shrinkage in the middle. I'm not going to have a good time if I try to make coasters with this piece of aluminum, for example. And, you know, actually now that I think about it, this is a problem that's haunted me since my early days of learning CNC. I remember hating my life when I was trying to make aluminum coasters back in 2017. Warped, thin aluminum sucks, regardless of your workholding methodology. What works much better is cast tooling plate, like Mike 6 or ATP 5, but these materials are noticeably more expensive. If I were a job shop though, I'd happily pass those costs onto whoever is in need of my services and the accuracy of the Datron, but for a personal project that I'm bankrolling myself like these drink coasters, well, I'd rather go out of my way and try and work around the limitations of cheaper materials. Plastics aren't much better, by the way. Many thermoplastics have internal stresses because of temperature gradients during their formation. On a different CNC platform, you might use a squishy gasket to overcome these flaws, but using the Datron system? Your two options are to either invest more money to get tighter tolerance materials, or invest more time into developing workarounds to compensate for your stock material shortcomings. Eddie Kramer, for example, made a custom fixture with tiger claw clamps to hold warp sheets in place while he faced them to get one good flat side. That'll get you to a point where you're able to start machining on a vacuum table, but you're not out of the woods yet. 
If you need to cut through your material, be it profiling your part, drilling holes, or any other operation that will expose more bare vacuum card, the resulting leakage will reduce the pressure that can be sustained by the pump. And if the part you're machining is very small, like just a couple square inches in area, by the end of the program, you might only have 30 or 40 pounds of force pressing that part to the table. You're going to have to take very light cuts that won't put much side load into the material. Now, in case I've been a little too doom and gloom about the situation, I want to emphasize that these are all surmountable issues as long as you're diligent about managing your vacuum budget. These are just some of the things you need to be mindful of when using vacuum workholding. For the majority of what I do on the Neo, I'll start with a larger piece of stock with plenty of surface area. There's a good chance that the material isn't sitting perfectly flat, so I'll then take measures to improve how it seals against the vacuum table, like slotting the material to make it more flexible. Usually, we're making multiples of something per cycle on the Daytron, so there's almost always a way to subdivide the stock around the finished part. But it's important to always leave an onion skin because the stock is stronger when it's intact. Each segment's neighbor will help keep the other from shifting. Once I've rehabilitated my vacuum pressures to respectable levels, I can then get to rubbing my stock. At the end of the program, when I'm ready to liberate my parts, I'll use very conservative speeds and feeds and small diameter end mills. Usually all I need to do here is cut through the onion skin left from previous operations. And when a plan like this comes together, the result is extremely satisfying. But as I mentioned in my last video, starting with a square or rectangular sheet of stock wouldn't be all that efficient for coaster making. The percentage of material that would be wasted starting from this is pretty high. High enough that outsourcing stock preparation was economically competitive. In my last video, I showed how I used Send Cut Send for my isogrid coaster blanks. It was cheaper for them to cut hexagons out of a huge sheet of aluminum than it was for me to cut hexagons out of the aluminum sheets that would fit on my CNC. But this is something that only worked at scale. You see, I had to buy a hundred blanks to make it cost effective. So if you do the math after making about a dozen coasters on the Nomad, I was very financially motivated to make these blanks usable on the Daytron Neo. And this complicated things because now I wasn't following my usual roadmap for success with vacuum workholding. I'm not starting out with a single piece of stock with generous shared surface area. Each coaster is only a couple square inches, so they're going to be held relatively weakly. If I cut too aggressively, these blanks will get knocked out of place. But even before I could worry about the cam process for this, I needed to figure out the answer to a more fundamental problem, and one I had to deal with on the Nomad as well. How would the CNC machine know where the blanks were so it could perform the coaster machining in the right location? I could use the built-in probing system to locate each coaster blank one by one, but to compensate for orientation and then automating it across multiple workpiece coordinates, that requires a better understanding of the next operating system than I have. The low-tech analog solution I came up with was to machine a plastic jig to position my coaster blanks. The spacing enforced by this frame also conveniently positions each blank over one of the individually controllable zones of the Neo's vacuum table, 100mm apart. To focus the suction from each of these vacuum zones, I machined out what was effectively a miniature vacuum fixture that used the Daytron vacuum fixture as the manifold. On the bottom of each coaster zone, I poked a tiny pinhole through the underlying vacuum card. Remember, vacuum card is semi-permeable, but it's still pretty restrictive. Just because you can see some bare vacuum card through the fixture doesn't mean that that surface area of exposed vacuum card is letting enough air flow freely to create a vacuum underneath a larger area. I can't openly recommend this technique since that means there's a risk of chips potentially getting sucked through the vacuum pump, but if you're diligent about cleaning out your fixture between cycles, I think the risk is pretty minor. On top of my supplementary fixture, I machined a hexagonal grid to distribute the suction underneath each coaster blank. The first use of this strategy was for what was supposed to be a simple set of operations to lightly face my stock, machine very shallow pockets to receive cork, and profile the outside to get each blank to an identical size. My vacuum fixture was a sheet of two-tone HDPE that I surfaced to get smooth, really because it was cheap and plentiful in the shop. That actually ended up being a terrible mistake because HDPE is notoriously slippery. I ended up having to tape my vacuum card in place to keep everything from sliding around. I also had leakage issues, so I couldn't use all six zones that I'd planned to populate. This relegated me to using just four and sometimes even two vacuum zones to improve process reliability. There were some regrettable failures that happened before I got this fully worked out. 
What I learned for the next supplementary vacuum fixture was that I needed to use a different material as the base. This time I would use acrylic instead of HDPE. And since my blanks were now all exactly the same size and the outer walls were cut and finished already, I could machine pockets for my blanks to drop into. I made sure to sneak up on the perfect fit in these pockets by tweaking the stock to leave parameters in Fusion 360. It's the same way I creep up on a particular dimension on a Shapeoko or a Nomad. This guaranteed that each blank would sit exactly where the machine expected it, with minimal wiggle room. It also meant that I wouldn't need to rely on atmospheric pressure and the resulting static friction between the aluminum and the vacuum cart to keep the blanks from sliding around laterally. The pockets would hold the blanks in the X and Y direction, and the vacuum would handle forces in the Z direction. With the work holding and workpiece locating problems effectively solved, I think this would be a good time to talk about Fusion 360 and how to make toolpads for the Neo versus toolpads for the Nomad. Both the similarities and the differences here. First up, the similarities. If you know how to create a setup and toolpads for a hobby CNC, you know how to create toolpads for an industrial CNC. It's literally the same process. You need to define your stock in the setup menu and identify where your origin is. This may vary depending on how you plan to set your zero. On the Neo, I always set my zero at the bottom of the stock because the vacuum card is my reference height, and I personally favor the front right corner for my XY zero. The process to make tool pads is exactly the same, just with different speeds and feeds, and this time the coolant dropdown actually does something. You export the toolpaths exactly the same, making sure you select the appropriate post-processor for your machine. Programs for the Daytron Neo aren't actually in G-code. They resemble a higher-order programming language, like C. But that's entirely transparent to you in Fusion because the post-processor handles that translation for you. Overall, there's very little difference between how you program for a hobby CNC and an industrial one. But from a philosophical point of view, for me, there's one immediate difference. On the Nomad, I'm not afraid to fail. If I stall the spindle, I stall the spindle. I'll just try again with more conservative speeds and feeds. If I break a tool, it's a cheap mistake, just swap in a new one. With an industrial CNC, the Neo in particular, things are different. Doing cam for the Daytron drives me to a level of paranoia I don't experience with even the Hosses or the brothers in the shop. A 40,000 RPM spindle isn't cheap, and the precision bearings required for that spindle to reach that speed don't appreciate sudden impacts or axial shock loading. An accidental rapid move into stock, or a plunge move where you typed 8,000 millimeters per minute instead of 800, that could be a $6,000 repair, best case. It's closer to $20,000 if the spindle can't be repaired and needs to be replaced in its entirety. Fortunately, that is a very rare occurrence. The 2 kilowatt spindle in the Neo also can't be run at its full rated torque for too long. That will reduce its life expectancy. It's nothing like a Haas where you sometimes see spindle load at 110%. Daytron's recommendation is to keep it below 70%. That means the Neo in certain situations is only as powerful as the Shapeoko HDM running on 220. Because of all of this, when I pick cutting parameters, I'm using a combination of suggested starting points from Daytron as well as drawing from past experience. And then, on top of this, I also sometimes back off on my speeds and feeds a little extra to account for the fact that I'm going to be using vacuum work holding. I don't want to risk having my stock moving on me in the middle of a cut. In my head, I've got a whole table of correction factors I apply in different scenarios. Using a longer tool that's more prone to deflection? Back off 20% from Daytron's recommendations. Yes, even its recommended speeds and feeds for that particular long tool. I'm paranoid like that. Machining something with only a couple square inches of surface area exposed to the vacuum, like a coaster, back off another 15%. It's very much like how you might back off on your cutting parameters if you're using double-sided tape versus using clamps. So keeping all these things in mind, this is how my adaptive roughing tool paths compared between the Nomad and the Neo. On the Nomad, using an 8th inch end mill, I was running at 24,000 RPM and targeting a feed per tooth of 0.044 millimeters. That's just shy of 2 thou per revolution. Those two values form the basis for the cutting feed rate. Optimal load was 0.28 millimeters and the step down was 1.15 millimeters. That 1.15 value was chosen so that the total depth of the isogrid pocket would be machined in three nearly identical step downs. Those speeds and feeds provided safe, consistent results on the Nomad where pushing it any harder would make the cut start sounding bad. 
On the Neo, using a 3mm single flute end mill, I was running at 36,000 RPM, targeting a chip load of 0.105mm. That's a slightly smaller end mill, taking twice a larger bite out of aluminum every single revolution. Part of it is the extra speed and rigidity offered by the spindle, and part of that is the presence of an alcohol mist delivered by compressed air that cools the aluminum, forms a momentary lubricating film on the cutter, and blasts chips out of the way. Optimal load was 0.475 millimeters, and the step down was 2.2 millimeters. That evenly divided the roughing of the isogrid pockets into two passes. So, looking at just the raw numbers for the adaptive pocketing toolpath, the Neo is 675% faster than the Nomad. And that's not factoring in that the rapid position moves are also faster, and that you need fewer of these rapid positioning moves because you have fewer passes to complete the pocket. And then there's a tool changer so I don't need to babysit the machine, and then I have the space to machine more coasters at a time. And if I'm being honest, I could probably push the Neo harder than this. I'm pulling punches by only using a 3mm end mill to rough with. It takes the Nomad the better part of an hour to do one coaster. The Neo does that in less than 10 minutes unattended with better surface finish. These advantages in numbers should come as no surprise. A Neo costs 30 to 40 times more than a Nomad 3. It better be way faster. As an aside, I will say that a machining farm of 40 nomads running in unison would be an awesome sight to behold, but a terrible thing to listen to. When we surface nomad tables before shipping them to customers, the shop sounds like a stadium of Vuvuzela wielding soccer fans. It's absolutely terrible. Getting back on topic though, processing blanks like this, I managed to stack up dozens of coasters over a single weekend with very little time where I had to be attentive to the machine. Loading the machine was much easier as I didn't have to deal with prying parts off the table, peeling off tape, applying new tape to new blanks, and then carefully placing them on the machine. I just turned off an air valve, removed the finished coasters, cleared off any chips on the fixture, and stuck new blanks on. I made sure I didn't turn off the airflow to the back half of the vacuum table where a portion of my acrylic fixture sat. That kept the fixture in place while I switched out the hexagon blanks. And between different days of running coasters, I could use the built-in probing to re-zero the machine to my fixture. And did I mention the surface finish? The Neo spindle paired with MQL spray left the walls and floors of the isogrid looking phenomenal. I actually changed some of the finishing toolpaths to accentuate this. In the bottom of the isogrid pockets, for example, I used a large step-over adaptive toolpath for the floor finishing. I think that adaptive pattern in a high sheen left by a polished single flute end mill looks amazing. Near the end, I surprisingly found that there was one blank in my collection that was so deformed it wouldn't work on the vacuum table. I never thought that you would find this severe of a bend in a large aluminum sheet, but maybe I just got unlucky and this hexagon was cut out of a badly dented corner in the parent sheet. This blank was sent to the Nomad for machining. Double-sided tape did what vacuum could not in this case. Score one for the little machines. So looking back at this whole experience, what have we learned? Well, uh, the more expensive CNC was faster. Big surprise there. Bigger spindle, bigger servos, coolant, ATC, these are all things that make a world of difference in machining things quickly and efficiently. What about, can money buy machining happiness? Well, in some ways, this system does make things truly delightful. There are times where this kind of vacuum system really does feel magical. And a mist lubrication system that leaves no residue is awesome. My coasters could go straight to anodizing with very basic cleaning. The flexibility of a tool changer, freaking love it, that's probably the only feature I lust for on a desktop CNC these days, so I would actually say yes. Money can buy things that will make your life as a machinist better, and happier. I should also add though that if you're trying to evaluate the value proposition of a Datron Neo for yourself, my work here does not remotely do it justice. The accuracy of this machine and the sterilizing nature of its coolant system means that unless you make things that are medical, optical, and or aerospace, you're probably not making the most of its capabilities. The flexibility and versatility of the work holding system just happens to be the icing on the cake and ultimately what I care about here. Now, is using the Neo and its vacuum table like enabling cheat codes in a video game? If you're machining flat things with plenty of surface area and few holes, 
Yeah, actually, warp holding becomes dead easy. But in cases like this one, where I'm trying to machine multiple parts in one go, I have to say, things don't quite feel like I have god mode enabled. As effortlessly as the Neo rips through aluminum, a lot of thought had to go into programming it to do so successfully, and more importantly, reliably. There's no substitute for hard-earned knowledge and know-how in machining. There will always be some trial and error and some painful learning moments in your CNC journey. It's just like driving. You can buy a fast car, but that won't make you a great driver. It takes time and practice to get to that point. So until there's like chat GPT for cam, you'll only ever get as much out of a machine as you put in. And I don't say this to be a CNC shill, but a desktop CNC can absolutely provide a relevant education if your long-term goal is to build up to a career as a machinist or a CNC programmer. So many of the fundamentals are the same, but with costs and stakes low enough that you're not afraid to try new things that end up teaching you even more. I hope you guys found this meandering video interesting. There was just so much new stuff and techniques with the Neo that I wanted to share, and it took a while to get through it all. If you think I should show more machining from beyond my usual desktop CNC comfort zone, let me know in the comments below. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back in probably two or three months with more CNC content and DIY nonsense, and hopefully a functional garage shop.